that involves at least work analysis, something to try to make this thing work better, restrict its experience. I don't want to go through this. Uh, it's going to get you a sense of something. I hope I'm starting to clear to you. You need math, you need physics, you need chemistry, you need biology. And, and you know, ultimately, when you put them all together, you'll need one that is practical, you'll need engineering. Okay? It's all going to happen that way. Here's our agreement, what we're finding, overall agreement. Uh, identifying that metabolites will sweat, uh, wash sweat slightly, that's all. Concentrate everything, extract and sweat, fragment is isolated. We identified 27 metabolites by using something called MSMS, or MMS spectrometry. After you, I'll explain it, after you've done one mass spectrum and you know that a certain M over Z ratio is there, you take that line and you break it apart by having it collide with something like a helium atom, and then you learn more about the structure. And uh, this is the changes in the dialysis patient. The fatty acid patterns are detectable when you sweat, showing you differences. Overall decrease in saturated fatty acid levels in the dialysis patient sweat compared to healthy controls. Okay. Changes in fatty acid are consistent in blood and urine analysis. Uh, this is the first study to identify detectable pattern acid changes in sweat. Okay? Again, sweat. Dialysis, four hours. Sweat, nothing. Okay? And yet we can learn things from this. And our method of rigorous chemistry, analytical method, and machine learning for identifying changes in the sweat profile, interpreting which changes are relevant to disease metabolism, and the combination of this DASI MSI and machine learning is critical for fast rapid testing from small sample volumes and focusing on the most informative changes. Oh, 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 thank you. This to you. I'm not getting any questions in my trip. Okay. So concluding remarks, if I might. The combination of mass spectrometry, and you understand what that is, and machine learning can be used to identify Diagnostic signatures from human biofluids with high accuracy in a rapid manner. This talk examined what saliva, urine, blood, sweat, and tissues did all that. And you saw how. Okay? And it's simple. I'm telling you, people here, you can do it, and the future is huge. This has not yet become routine practice. My hope is this will become something that can be done in the future. Okay? So much information becomes available that we can discover diseases <coughs> and the metabolic pathways, and we can imagine applying these insights for developing personalized medicines that come from this, what we do for each individual. Okay? And this combined methodology can be used for monitoring individual health, for detecting sickness at early stages, and for evaluating the efficacy of effectiveness of treatment. Wow. Huh? And this might revolutionize medical care. So what I'm telling you about, which sounds like, oh, a little droplets, who cares about little droplets, right? You know, whatever it is, suddenly now has big consequences, I think. Because it could change the way we think of doing medicine and, and what can be done. I really like the idea that I can have an annual checkup or even, even more often, whatever, and somebody can tell me what's going happening and do something and intervene early rather than late. It make a huge difference and change very much the quality of life. Well, I think we're probably done. I thank you all very much. So now the forum is open for questions. Some questions? Yeah. Let's get a microphone. I better put you in. Thank you, Professor Zayas, for the wonderful talk. I have a quick question regarding the failure of the test. For example, if an Indian goes to abroad, like the USA, and fully adopt the US food habits, is this the reason for the test failure? Or something else? I don't know the answer yet. I don't know. Okay? But I can tell you what troubles 
like that. I've, I've actually, believe it or not, we use the word patent, and I, I don't know if you call it patent here or patent, but whatever. I went to Stanford and, and I said I want to patent this technique about being able to use sweat. And um, the woman, I, mean, I told her we were able to look at age and gender, okay, and some idea of ethnicity from this technique. She said to me, you know, everybody else be dick with the nickname for Richards. She said, Dick, she says, if I look at someone, I can do the same. <laughs> I said, yes, but have you ever done this from a fingerprint? <laughs> you can't. That's, I'm looking at a fingerprint, but we can't. And, and, and that's the part I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> I don't know the answer to this question. It's good. We, we need to learn more, but we are starting to have needs of learning about this. And I, I, I felt that's an application. Hmm? So, uh, thank you, Professor, for the nice talk. And it's definitely going to like, be used for diagnostic of different diseases. My question is more like basics. So, uh, I've done some proteomics, so I'm trying to understand the difference between like basics of this paper, uh, mass spectrometry, and regular ESI. So, in regular ESI, basically, we uh, use some gases to push the ions. So, which part of this technique is going to be this paper? Like, I also understand that paper can be released if you apply very high voltage to paper or anything. Uh, you, you, you were asking about whether or not voltage matters? I mean, no, voltage will definitely be going to be useful. But I'm saying the paper yes, the which you're going to use, like which part of the river ESI is going to be replaced by the use of the paper. Any molecule which, which uh, how do I say, it, is absorbed <laughs> by paper will be hurt by this process. Any molecule that spreads when you add a solvent in paper will be hurt by this process. Seriously, you don't want to use paper. Paper's cheap, but you don't. You want to use a non-porous material that you can make, as I showed you, conductive. That really works. Hope I'm clear. Now, you might ask, why didn't I go after proteins? Yeah. Okay. Proteins are not as soluble as lipids. Okay, and the li lipids are fatty, fatty, fat type things, and I don't do fat with water. I actually, you may add some water, but I do some other chemicals that are better solvents, something called acetyl nit nitrile, a dimethyl form of it, or dissolved fats. You can pick other, other things for other purposes. Oh, oh you're, you're seeing. So, but this one, oh, and, 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 and I'll continue to first, if I might, just, just a moment. And you might say, well, well, you know, this, you aren't doing genetics. Why aren't you doing genetics? Okay. Well, I am in a certain sense because it is your genes which make your proteins and it's your proteins which ultimately run through the body that make your lipids. And so they're all connected. And I'm just looking at the end products here <laughs> when I'm looking at it. So this kind of mass spectrometry is not very suitable for proteins, right? So it's not, not that suitable for proteins. Okay. Okay. Much more suitable for smaller molecules. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the talk. So you mentioned that it is uh, important to study the biomarker pattern, right? So my question is for a particular disease. If we take different samples, say whether it is a sweat, blood, so the biomarker pattern will be different in different cases for a particular disease, or will it be uh, same? They, they might well be. That's correct. There's, there's a difference for different types of cancer. Yeah. And we will see that. And so, so, and so in the longer run, we not only want to want to not just look for one type of cancer, but many different types of cancer. Yeah. I haven't done that. No, uh, what I'm asking is, say, suppose for oral cancer, if we are taking the sample like sweat or saliva or urine or blood, so the biomarker pattern will be different, right? Yes. Okay. So for a particular disease, my question is, which sample to be taken? Like, which sample we should analyze? For getting the accurate result. Uh, I don't know the answer. Okay, I, I don't know the answer yet. You, first of all, I hope you realize how new this all is. And I, I, I need much more studies to be made. Uh, I, I need to explain some frustrations here to you, so you appreciate. Suppose I really want to go after answering your question. Where do I get the money to do that? I might write to the National Institutes of Health of my country, but they'll say, you're not a doctor. No, and they'll be very 
actually biased against anything I do. So I, I need to collaborate to get it to happen. That's what I'm trying to do to, to start with. And it's still, it takes a long time to make this happen. In my country, unfortunately, it takes like a minimum of nine months from the time you put in a grant to ever getting it funded, often longer. Okay. And, uh, and so a lot of this work is poorly funded. Okay. I can't do all the things that we want to do. I have very, very few people working on this, and the room for working on this is very large. There's much to be done. And this is a region, if you'll notice carefully, look carefully, this is normal, that seems to be cancer. And you can see certain regions light up differently, right? And again, I can't by just looking at one of these determine what's going on, but the computer can look at the pattern and be really smart about it. And, and saying what's happening. It's for taking advantage of data, machine learning to make this happen. I'm showing you that it's there. Uh, and I like, here's the light seat I mentioned before. Okay. I, I don't make clear. This is a wonderful technique. This is going to be chemical analysis through mass spectrometry. And we're doing imaging. Now, where's this imaging coming from? Suddenly, what an imaging pattern. I have a droplet. It's really small, right? And it only wets a little spot. But I can now take my sample and put it on an XY translator. Move it this way, move it this way, and like a TV screen, make faster back and forth and make a chemical map on each pixel, picture elements called a pixel. Each pixel will contain a hundred to a thousand different chemicals. Fine. I record them all. And I'm drowning in data, and people who do machine learning just love it because they want data. Okay? <laughs> um, human beings, you know, drowned in it. Can't make it up. But it's okay. We can put it all together. Let's go on. And so here, using now blood, and we've got the same idea and, uh, in which you can now look at blood. Um, and blood is done the same way. Now, blood. For me, it's not as nice as spit in that it's, you got to, you know, give blood. That means you get jacked somewhere. But interestingly, the blood contains also metabolites. And we can do the same thing again as to whether or not we have cancer or not. Now, it's not the same as making a, a map. Neither was the, the, the spit making a map. We had to use that decent MSI for a map. And we're seeing the same type of stuff. And we'll go on. Look, here's the training and validation sets. And look how we're separating the normal control, which is 100 samples, from 154, which are the ones that are sick. And uh, I'm showing you how they're nicely separated. And now we get accuracy of not nearly 90% okay, in this. You can see, some things are ambiguous right here. They are, you know, not stop this right away. So, uh, this is now published 2021. I hope you're seeing how recent what I'm telling you is. Um, and this is now the, the various things that we're seeing and, and what's upgraded and what's downgraded. I don't want to talk about it, but you're getting the idea. You can learn a lot. Okay, individually, there are no obvious differences among the four stages yeah, yeah, for these analytes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Machine learning, look at what appears. Yeah, okay. And here we go. With machine learning, determine what stage your cancer's at, whether you have advanced cat cancer or beginning cancer. This is going to be really important in how you treat somebody. This thing's going to be powerful another way. Okay, somebody's sick. Uh, all of us get sick at some time. Somebody's sick, and uh, you normally give some type of drug, or you cannot you, have a cancer if you can, but you give some type of drug. Is the drug working? This will allow you to find out. That, that's good. In, in, in a very simple way, we start to now see the advantages. This is going to lead to what I'm going to call a personalized medicine for each individual who will, will learn something as we go on. Okay, and so here's a summary of this machine learning and clinical tests. And we're looking at the oral cancer by saliva, by serum. Here's pancreatic cancer, and there's bladder cancer, which we just started to do. Here's the accuracy, okay, and, and you, you get a sense of what, what it's like. 
This is outstanding in general, I find, in myself. Let me, let me try to tell you why this has such huge advantages. And now I'm telling you a, a secret which the medical profession does not generally advertise to you. If they cut out a piece of tissue, okay, and they give it to a pathologist who stains it and looks, in fact, I should stop a moment and ask you, how, how do you know somebody who's had cancer, who's had an operation for cancer? Come on, some of you must. You're just being, you're being shy. I can't believe the rest of you don't know. Yeah, well. okay. okay, you will know in such cases that the operation went on for hours. Oh, sure. Correct? More than one hour, often four hours, oh, six hours, four hours. Okay, often yeah. anesthesia, and all the rest. Okay, really blunt. Oh, right. Is it because the surgeon is so slow in cutting? No, no, <laughs> 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 let me explain. This is, this is real, real. The surgeon makes a cut, then he takes the cut, the, what do you want to call it, and he hands it to a pathologist who stains it and looks at it under a microscope and says to the surgeon, you got to go more to the right, you oh, yeah, got to go deeper, <laughs> or something. You see what's happening? It does this until you try to get all the cancer out. And when you finish, I'm telling you the sadness. Uh, you know, now, they don't want to really tell you this. Uh, about one third of the time, they don't get it right. Okay? They, they leave some cancer cells in. That's why often people who have cancer after surgery then have to go through chemotherapy or radiation therapy because of some stuff that's been left in, even though they've tried their best. Okay? Now, if we had a way of being able to look that tissue that's cancer versus non-cancer, we can help the surgeon. And if we could do this quickly, everybody would be happier. And so that's one of the things I'm, I'm involved I'm in working on. And uh, we can get to that. Oh, here's another, another story, if I might. Okay. Um, you know, you can pick your favorite disease, whatever. I'm gonna talk next about bladder cancer. It's commonly seen in the aging population over 70 years of age. It, as high recurrence rate means it happens again and becomes the fourth leading cancer in the United States with about 83,730 new cases and about 17,200 deaths in 2021 estimated by the American Cancer Society. I just the American figures. Currently, the gold standard of the BC discovery and diagnosis is something involving kind of up. Uh, fancy word, cystoscopy, okay? Transurethral resection of bladder tumor, or T-U-R-B-T. This image-guided inspection is invasive, right? And low in patients' compliance. People don't want to continue this at all. Although routine BC scanning is still not recommended among the general population, discovering BC through a routine urinary examination would provide more treatment options and a higher chance of survival at an early stage of development. This is work now, what? This work has been submitted for publication. I think it's just been published, okay? But you'll get the sense of what I'm, what I'm telling you now. I'm telling you things that are really new. Uh, and notice the collaboration. This person here, Joseph Liao, happens to be a, a, a surgeon uh, at Stanford Medical School. I'm collaborating with the medical people. Let me. How many medical people are here? How many have been hurt in these feelings? The medical people are really driven hard by the number of sick people we're dealing with. Generally, the, 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 they're great at helping you get better, but they're not the place where innovation takes place. They don't have time. They want it very badly to sit other people, but they don't have time. It's only by a, a collaboration that we make this happen possible. Also, the collaboration means we get samples from the hospital. Stanford's nice and it has a hospital on the campus. Okay, I'm trying to give you a picture of how this goes. Okay, so let's go on. And we use conductive polymer spray ionization in spectrometry combined with machine learning for urinary metabolic profiling. Urinary, what does it mean? I mean, I'm talking about urine. Okay? And um, we achieve a sensitivity of 100% in a five-fold cross-validation set. Okay, 48, 48. And a 95.2% sensitivity, okay, 
and, uh, and only 10 seconds needed to record the signal of, for, from each sample. I'm telling you again, urinating is something that everyone does, okay? And no one, no one is possessive about their urine. I don't think. Okay? It's easy to get the samples. Okay? Uh, it's just important. I'm trying to get to, you to understand. And if I could screen, or I, meaning the world, if we had some means of screening this, we would catch these cancers at an early stage. And again, I want to point out to you something I think you've heard before. If you can catch cancer at an early stage, you generally can cure it. If it's at a late stage, particularly when it's spread all over the place, you know, sad. And you can't do anything like it. Okay, these, these are the facts. Okay, and now I'm going to tell you about um, a graduate student of mine, uh, just on the job. Okay, and the question is, can we replace the chemical analysis of spit and serum and urine, okay, with sweat? Do you care about your sweat? <laughs> Most people do not. Okay, I tell you, I had a lot of trouble because I wanted to collect sweat, and Stanford University made me take each individual and sign a consent form and agree to randomize who they were. <laughs> okay, and I didn't, at the time I was protesting, but now I understand why. It turns out the sweat tells you a lot about yourself, more than you realize. For example, I'm going to show you, because you can understand from sweat, I can collect so much. I can find out whether or not you're taking what drug from sweat, including illegal drugs. So now you see that more people are worried than at Stanford what I was doing. Okay, this really is a very invasion of your privacy. It's not an invasion of your body because you don't care about your sweat. But I'm telling you, you have all that information. I hope I'm, hope I'm getting across this to you. Okay, let's see now what we Hopefully next slide. Okay, here's the methodology. And, uh, you take a glass microscope slide, oh, everybody knows what that is, and you draw it once across the forehead, like this. Okay. Yeah, that gives us a the surface. Then we're going to use desorption electric spray ionization. We're going to bombard it with droplets. Now, I'm not trying to make an image anymore. I just want to get what's there, the signal. Go into our mass spectrometer. Here are going to analyze our peaks. And once again, we're going to collect the data to copy for example, okay. and for each slide, spectrum is average from a slide scan, a scan across. And here we go. And here's something you, you might not realize. If you look at the sweat from your finger, here's the sweat from your forehead. Also, your armpit or your genital region, they all look the same. <laughs> do, you, do you see any difference? I don't see any difference. Some places have more sweat, some places have less sweat, but the chemicals in the sweat are the same for you. And first, interesting fact. Next, I wanted to show you what happened when I had two fingerprints, okay, overlapping. The, uh, where I live, the FBI, <laughs> Federal Bureau of Investigation, doesn't want overlapping fingerprints hopeless. <coughs> they don't know what to do with them. But let me show you. Here they are, overlapping. And this one is a Chinese male. This is an Indian female. Both are members of my research group. My research group is very international. I <laughs> asked my host, Professor Nanamani, about that. And you'll see it's true. Yeah, so you gave samples to this. OK. I don't think this one's you. <laughs> <laughs> Now, 
in 2017, and this is called Latent Fingerprints Using NAS Spectrometry in Machine Learning. That's super cool. I wanted you to see how this works. Well, you say, male, female, good, I'll just look for hormones. There's no hormones. Okay, it's just sweat. Okay? <laughs> this is a feature selection identification. A is the relative importance of each peak in gender classification. Okay. B is the same spectrum of male and female zoomed in at peak 481.42. Let's find it. Somewhere in here is 481, this big peak here. See it? Okay? And here's what the male looks like. Here's what the female looks like. <coughs> so it's easy. But that's why the computer's doing so well. And 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 tell you why? No, no, no way. As I told you, the computer doesn't teach you anything. No way. Rapid and convenient 
complex samples from individual sensitivity to detect metabolic changes from small volumes after to identify key metabolic changes related to the disease. What are we going to do? Our methodology, we're going to use again DESI MS to measure metabolites. Use machine learning to identify significant differences and make the model with known biochemical metabolism. And here we are. Sample summary. We have 38 people were healthy, uh, 12, you know, on dialysis. I wish I had bigger numbers here, but it's uh, uh, this is what we've collected. Okay. Um, and uh, these are the people with checkups up and other diseases, pre and post. So this could be a way of doing chemical analysis of what's in the droplet. Okay. And now let me tell you the obvious advantage. Paper is cheap. It's abundant and it's easy to use. Okay. Now let me tell you the disadvantages of paper. It's actually, believe it or not, dirty. Now you won't, you're surprised because I can use f what's called filter paper and I'm still telling you it's dirty in terms of all the chemicals that are in it. It's not a clean process, <coughs> I'm sorry to say. What else? It is hydrophobic. What does that word mean? Hydro from water, and philic from some type of love. It loves water. Any of you who've played with toilet paper know this. You know, put a piece of toilet paper in water, you watch the water run through the toilet paper. It's the same thing with paper, right? We all understand that. The cellulose let brick of paper. And this is bad, as I'm going to try to show you. This is vantage. Okay, let's go on. Uh, now I'm going to tell you about something we've been involved with. This is work, uh, start with my postdoc, Dr. Maria Dulé. And uh, here are some, by the way. Okay, let's, the question is, does this method work for organic molecules? Now let me first explain to everybody. Organic molecules means molecules which contain carbon. Okay, many hydrocarbons, many things. And we're going to go on and you will see that it does. Okay, depending on what we do. It also depends on what solvent we use. Okay, many organics are not soluble in water, don't dissolve in water. But we could use some other solvent, <coughs> like some alcohol to move them along. Uh, special alcohols, methanol, CH3OH, whatever. Okay. And now I want to show you here, if you look carefully, here is the polymer that she's made, which is a, 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 a actually involving a siloxane, a, silic a silicon oxygen-based species, which I'm not going to describe, but it's a different polymer. This is paper. See how it spreads on paper? When you apply, this is a, a dye called methylene blue, okay? This is a, this is a one microliter drop of methylene blue in water, on an OSX polymer left and filter paper right. The trouble with this is you're losing signal because it's spreading. And so we, 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 we're we diluting what we have. We'll also see another problem. If, if something loves water and it's hydrophilic, it'll stick to the paper. Okay? You all know that. Okay? <laughs> Very much. This is going to be not for us it is going to be what we call hydrophobic, hates water. And it will therefore allow things to move much more readily. We're, we're understanding. A lot of words being thrown out here. Sorry. We'll continue. So let's look at these particular compounds. Some of these compounds, not, nobody should remember anything. Remember, no notes are needed here. It's all a matter of understanding the concepts. Okay. This is something called phenobarbital. It, it, it's an interesting. Um, material, uh, people are interested in. This is called ethyl glucuronide, which people want to know about if you've been drinking alcohol. This one is used. And this is something called vancomycin. Oh, big thing, isn't it? And um, vancomycin is an antibiotic. Helps kill things, right? And people want to know, is there still vancomycin in something or not? And these are real interesting questions. You want to test things. Now, let me show you what it's like. Go on to the next slide. And so I'm showing you the polymer spray 
and the paper spray, <coughs> polyescent PS. This is paper spray. And I'm showing you a scale, OK? And, and I'm showing you that, in general, what we see is that um, the, the um, polymer, for example, this is this, this material, ETG, in, in, in synthetic urine, that's what S urine stands for, is much better protected. see no signal, it just all gets absorbed. <laughs> okay, it's a failure. So we're really seeing an advantage of polymers, of uh, polymer surface display. And we're going to use this. And one particular <coughs> development has been done by another, one of my postdocs, this is Dr. Mm -hmm. Xiao Wei Song, okay, who joined by Professor mm -hmm. Hao Chen, who's now in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. He is now in mm -hmm. my lab right now. And mm -hmm. what we're going to do is make now, a conductive polymer. How do we make a conductive polymer? We're going to take something called carbon nanotubes. Some of you have heard about that. And we're going to put it in something, and we're going to make it so it's easily conductive. Now I don't have to worry about the solvent conducting the, the uh, voltage. I can have it all easily done with just an alligator clip. That's what's shown here, connecting to a high voltage. We put a trace of biofluid, and spray we go. So for race consumption of test sample, you see okay, it's cheap, clean, consumable materials, direct, simple, fast. We think it can be put to care test, and it's qualitative and semi-quantitative, as we'll see. And I, I hope now, hope I'm not blocking this for you, you, you can see, look, because we scattered, we did a gillian neon laser to see this scattering. Those are the droplets going in, okay? This is the electric spray flue. And this is now work of 2018. Okay. Here's the setup. This is the entrance of the mass spectrometer, the big vacuum in back here. It's all done in air. It's very easy to apply the sample uh, this way. Okay. And now, here we're going to show you some comparisons again. This is glucose. Do you know what glucose is? It's a sugar, very important sugar, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we all crave glucose. <laughs> One way or another. In fact, I've never met a sugar I didn't like. <laughs> okay. Anyways, to continue, this is glucose. <coughs> and I'm going to show you the nature of this. Okay? And this is something called melamine. Okay? Uh, here. And, 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 and Melamine is unfortunately a compound shown here, which has been added to milk um, in China, which caused a lot of people to get kidney stones and even some young babies to die. Okay, that the reason for adding it, people thought, was that it looks more like protein. Therefore, they could dilute the milk and sell, sell milk they got for for <laughs> make more money. That was what was going on. Okay, um, so and, and I'm showing you these. And I'm showing you that the red is this method compared to like paper. And wow, there's no question this is superior. Okay, so now we have a way of looking at this and we can quantify it. Okay, quantitative uh, means to measure what the quantity of color is. And I'm showing you here's the paper, here's the cellulose, this is a scanning electron. Micrograph of this is 20 microns in scale. Of human hair, its diameter is 100 microns. This is one fifth the diameter of a human hair, and we're seeing the structure of paper. That's our that's our our fine version of cellulose. Here is the thing that we've made: our polymer that's conductive. It's made in something called polymethyl methacrylate and our carbon nanotubes. That's what these abbreviations stand for, and. Wow, it's not porous. This is porous. You see the porous? So it stuff sinks in. But we really know what we're doing here, how it works so far. 
Okay. Now, let's look some more. This is the improvement in ionization efficiencies for drugs in biofluids. Now, uh, we're interested in this. Because we're really going to try to make practical applications of this. Okay? And uh, this is another various interesting compounds. Some of you probably have heard of streptomycin. Okay? Probably the others you haven't heard of. But they're there in their structures. And, 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 and look again what we're able to do. When we, when we, when we switch to our uh, CPSI, we really can win what we're seeing. Okay? And that's correct. Now, let's actually apply it to something. I, I, I know this is going to surprise you as to where this talk is going. And I, I fear from your introduction <laughs> that I received it, you will not really appreciate it. Because I'm, I'm not going to tell you how to purify water. I'm going to tell you how to use biofluids that we all have. One of the things we all have, which we don't seem to care about, is is spit. Okay, so I love spit. Okay? And I want to now talk about oral cancer. Okay? Most cases are what's called squamous cell carcinoma, or OSCC. Okay? This is the oral cavity, the lip, the pharynx, the cheek, the tongue. Okay? It's high risk factors, and they come primarily from tobacco, betel nuts, alcohol, HPV. And there's 657,000 new cases and more than 330,000 deaths. This is the mortality is approximately 50%. Awful, okay? okay? But if diagnosed at early stage, before metastasis, before it spreads, there will be a 90% recovery rate and a five-year survival rate of over 50%. So you really want to check for this if you can. Not now, at the moment, nobody's doing anything about it. I I'm serious. <laughs> That's how it is. And now this is work that's been published now in 2020. So I'm, I'm giving you very recent work. It's not, not that old. And I'm going to show you how this works. Okay, guess what? You take saliva. People don't bother. People are generally happy to give you saliva. They're not so happy to give you blood. They're happy to give you urine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you put it onto our tip of our conductive polymer, attach the high voltage, and spray into our mass spectrometer. This produces then a mass spectrum. That's what it's called. And this mass spectrum, remember, is the mass to charge. The charge is just one, okay? But I'm giving you technically what it tends to be. And here we are. And uh, from this, we now are going to switch to something that involves machine learning. Suddenly now we're going to run into mathematics and statistics. And I need to explain this to you. Because this is going to change the world. It is already changing the world, by my mind. So this is something, I don't think schools yet teach much about this, but you can tell me I'm wrong. Um, look, if I'm given a bunch of objects, here are a bunch of objects on the table, a computer, this, this, and, and this, and I'm asked to talk about their weight and rank them in order of weight, I have no trouble, right? No problem at all. If I'm given 20 objects, they're about the same, and I'm supposed to look at them, and figure out what's happening, it hurts my head, right? Computers don't mind at all. <laughs> they're, they're willing to take all the data and look at it. And what we're gonna look for is a pattern. What we're gonna do is we're gonna train the computer. Uh, I need to explain. We're gonna first give the computer what you see if you get saliva from somebody who's sick. Then we're gonna get saliva from somebody who's well. And we're going to do this like 50 times, 50 different people. And it's going to learn from this that there's a pattern. Okay? The computer, I'm sorry, is dumb. It does not know why the pattern means what. But it will recognize that there's a difference in pattern. Then we're going to give it an unknown, somebody else's spit. <laughs> and I want to know, is that person healthy or sick? That's 
you can see what it's doing. This is powerful, actually. This, this is the idea behind machine learning, okay? Uh, what's also called artificial intelligence. And, okay, we then are going to rank all these, these features as shown here, okay? And then we'll, we'll see that they divide up into those that are healthy control, those that are pre-malignant, just starting, just worried, and those which really are sick, okay? And we'll see that they'll, they'll clump out this way, uh, what we're looking at. And uh, I now we can talk to you about some more math, um, but not that hard math to understand, I think, but mm -hmm. still, all people are standing. Come, there's, some, there's some seats, I think. No seats. Ouch. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> you can sit in the front to go on the steps. Get me closer. I'm sorry. Anyways, we continue. Look, this is the cancer. This is healthy. These are when you know, this is when you say it's cancer and it is cancer. That's called a true positive. I'll call that TP. This is when you say, this is cancer, but the person's healthy. That's called a false positive. Okay, MP. This is a healthy person, which you say has cancer. That's a false negative. Okay? This is a healthy person, but you say is healthy. That's a true negative. Now I want to define something for you, because this will be interesting. And, and you'll start to see the, the, the meaning of this. You talk about how sensitive it is in the percentage. That means you multiply by 100. And that's the true positives, or the true positive plus false positive. That's how sensitive it is. Okay? Then you can talk about how specific it is, the specificity. And that's the true negatives over the true negatives plus false negatives. How specifically is it getting me something? And then you can define what accuracy is. What do you mean by being accurate? What did it tell you? It means true positives plus true, true negatives over everything. Okay? That's how accurate you are. Now, I define the terms, and I want to tell you rapid screening of oral trauma cell cancer carcinoma by, by looking at spit, okay? By looking at the, the various lipids and metabolites that are found in spit. And here's what we see. I'm showing you an accuracy of about 87%. Now, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Okay? What is it doing? But I like that. That means about one time in ten it makes a mistake, okay, of some sort. And, and uh, this is how well it does in terms of, of uh, the various addiction classes that we see here. Uh, and it, 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 okay. This is on, on pre-malignant. It's, it's really quite amazing picking it out. On those that are malignant, it sometimes gets them in the pre-malignant. This. this is how good it is on healthy. Okay, let's get it all together. And uh, now I'm showing you dysregulated metabolism pathways and metabolic markers. A whole bunch of organic, of organic molecules. You asked about organic molecules. I hope you see that these are. Okay, and then we're taking it through. And we can, again, use the right solvent that we spray so that then dissolve the carried by the drop. And we're this. You don't need to know these names. Some of them you recognize, maybe like histamine and lysine. Okay. Others, you know, you don't know so much about. And we're seeing whether they're upregulated or downregulated when we have, you know, the healthy control, the pre-malignant, or the really sick. And, and wow, this is good. And I'm showing you the nature of all this and other questions. And I want to now go to the next topic. So this looks exciting to me. This looks like it's possible to implement this if you do huge screening of the population. You go to somebody's office and you give them spit. I put the spit in there. It's sent it to some place where it does this analysis. Okay? It's cheap, too. It hasn't happened yet, but I'm telling you there's going to be a revolution in medicine that I'm hoping you'll, you'll start to appreciate. And, and please notice, it won't be chemistry, it won't be physics. <laughs> it won't by, 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 be biology, it will be all of them, and engineering as well, all put together to make it happen. 
that's the nature of how things are happening today. Anyways, this is a really lovely invention. Again, the, the, the cups started with grains cooks through. And I want to show you, you now send a droplet on the surface. I hope you can see the top of Please drop the trumpet. Here we go. Splash. And now we let the splash go to the mass spectrometer. Like so. The droplet will dissolve something on the surface. And we want to carry what's on the surface into the mass spectrometer and see what we see. Okay? And here is the in situ validation of the <coughs> catalyte markers by what's called desorption electrospray ionization mass spectrometry imagery. That's the MSI. And here's the same. I'm to explain to you what mass spectrometry is, also abbreviated MS. Mass spectrometry. Okay, this is really goes back, in my mind, to uh, an amazing individual by the name of Thompson, okay, who at Cambridge University did discover really to learn about the, the mass of, and, uh, of the electron. And let me try to explain. If I had a leaf and I had this pointer and I dropped them in a vacuum, they would fall at the same rate. Now, in air, there's, of course, resistance. That's another thing. That's a different type of ion mobility or mobility of things. That's not what I'm talking about. In a vacuum, it would fall at the same rate. Now, if I had, however, some force to push on them, okay, I would actually deflect them different amounts. The leaf has a big area, a cross section. And if I had something which was a wind blower, the leaf would be blown this way. This is a smaller cross-section. It moves a little, not much. And so I need to apply some type of force, okay, to the direction of motion and see the deviation. And from this, I can get, actually, uh, it, it, the, the mass of the object if it has the same charge, because I'm going to actually use an electric field on charge. That's what I'm going to do. Or something that's charged. And so we really measure what's called M over Z, or M over Z, because I speak American. <laughs> and uh, that's the mass to the charge ratio. That's what a mass spectrometer does. Now, mass spectrometer, fascinating, fascinating. It begins with understanding of physics. You need to really learn physics to appreciate what you can do with mass spectrometry. Applications have been made a great deal in chemistry, okay, to be able to determine the mass of different molecules. We're going to see applications which go on to medicine and involving biology. This only becomes practical if people who start to understand the principles can apply them and make them in a practical, commercial way that involves engineering. Okay? All this comes together. And I, this is going to be part of my theme of what I'm going to try to tell you. Yes, you want to get something that you're excited about and study it well. But it turns out there's only, at most, one science. <laughs> They're all connected this way. And this is going to be important in terms of the future. Let's continue then. So what we have here, and I'm going to try to show you, is a, a triangle, paper triangle. We're going to put some type of wet thing here. We're going to apply some voltage so we charge things up. Droplets will come off, and they'll go into this device called the mass spectrometer. We'll be interested in what are the chemicals, or what are called analytes, in the droplet. We're going to make, start with, traditionally, this was made out of paper. Why? Paper's cheap. Paper's abundant, right? Paper spray mass spectrometry has emerged as a rapid, robust, quantitative, and qualitative method for analysis with little to no sample preparation required. Notice this is in the air. Right? And then it goes into the vacuum. Very easy to do. Okay, so people started doing paper spray. Okay, help me. Okay, uh, okay. And here are references to the first people who developed it at Purdue University. Okay, um, people like Oya and Cooks and so forth. Okay, from 2010. Yeah, yeah. Come on, I thought 